should have a place in countries such as the United States, where there is certain, according to something, reluctance to adopt this idea of mutual aid or solidarity as a society principle. And even the problem with this uh, suggestion is that even if theoretically it is well grounded in a popular theory of constitutionalism as a pre-commitment or, or collective self-restraint, it is simply impossible to implement in practice. Who would write such a constitution? What constitutional drafters would dare go against uh, certain widespread expectations, hopes, and claims which are uh, which have their place in uh, collective ideology. So, so we, even if the theory is good, I don't think it has any practical relevance. And certainly, the case of Central and East European constitutions and the question, the specific case that something wrote about, that is of socio-economic rights, uh, indicates that this sort of like counter-cultural approach to common ideology and constitutions simply is impossible to be implemented in practice. Now let me move to the second meaning of constitution and Hannah Pitkin's distinction. That is constitution as something that we do. And the advantage of this Theme is that it focuses our attention on the importance of constitutional process rather than constitutional, rather than the outcome of the process. And some constitutional scholars, not without justification, suggest that constitutional process is as important as the product of the process, that it has certain intrinsic value in itself, which is largely independent of the quality of the product. And if that's the case, <coughs> that is if constitutional process, or process of constitutional making and amendments of the Constitution has some intrinsic values by prompting the society for collective self-reflections about fundamentals by forcing us to think about the, uh, the uh, public reason or to deliberate about public good in a way which at least attempts to be impartial and independent of our or our constituents' self-interest. If all that is true as the proponents of so-called republican theory of constitutions and such as. Then perhaps the very fact that the constitutional process is very long is in itself not something that has to be deplored. Maybe the length of constitutional process is an important factor of providing conditions for this national deliberation in terms of public reason rather than private interests. On the other hand, there are good content independent reasons for so-called quick fix constitution, for constitutional process which is deliberately and self-consciously short and intense. Often constitutions and that is again the case, and that is especially the case of new states, are a way of asserting national independence and sovereignty on international stage. Because in our conventional thinking, constitutions are perhaps the paramount symptoms of national sovereignty. So if you look at various new states which emerge from the collapse of the Soviet Empire, at three Baltic states, at countries like Ukraine or Moldova, at uh, countries which 
uh, which emerged from the collapse of Czechoslovakia or from uh, old Yugoslavia, you'll see that in most of these countries, the constitutional process was very short and was largely oriented to the assertion in international, on the international scene of the independence of these countries. With the most extreme case being the case of so-called restorative constitution, constitution black in Latvia, which started from first restoring its, quickly its pre-Soviet 1920s constitution, and only then uh, deliberating about perhaps something more adapted to contemporary conditions and requirements. <coughs> there is also another reason why a very long and overdrawn constitutional, constitutional process may be detrimental. And that is <coughs> that such a process risks producing an erosion of the fundamental dualism between constitutional politics and day-to-day -day politics in constitution making and regular interest and compromise and horse trading type of politics in the country. And it is very important for preserving the integrity and the supreme uh, supremacy of constitution that constitution process be quite distinct from this day-to-day -day politics. But the longer it is, the more it risks being enmeshed in day-to-day -day politics and to become part of the regular political arguments. And perhaps the best, or I should say the worst, example of that pathology, that constitutional pathology, is the case of Hungary, where the constitutional process has been hijacked by party politics. And in the end, Hungary, up to now, that is, uh, well, 20 years after the collapse of communism, haven't come up with a new democratic <coughs> post-communist constitution, but rather has to do with a very, very, very heavily amended, quite incoherent old document, uh, which goes back to late 1940s, something which was unfortunately very much supported and favored a very strong constitutional court of that country, which saw in the absence of a new coherent and comprehensive textual constitution, an opportunity to produce what it called invisible constitution, and that is constitution created by the case law of the constitutional court. So let me in the end move to the third and perhaps most obvious understanding of the Constitution and Pitkin's uh, taxonomy of its functions. And then this Constitution is something that we have as an instrument. And I would like to, in the last few minutes of my remarks, focus on one aspect of this, uh, of this uh, theme only, and that is the issue to what extent the Constitution provides to various political actors an instrument of transforming the terms of political discourse, of infusing political discourse with constitutional arguments, of transforming the reasoning about politics into the reasoning which is par excellence constitutional. That is, to what extent constitution makes a difference? To what extent certain <coughs> arguments become salient and important in public debate, which wouldn't have appeared or would, which wouldn't have that salience if it were not for the constitution? And here the fundamental point to observe is that constitutions, of course, are not self implementing and self-interpreting, but that they are filtered in the public debate by particular institutions. And here the fundamental role is being played by constitutional courts. Now let me say 
just a few words about the experience of constitutional courts in this most recent wave of constitution, waving, uh, constitution making, and that is in Central and Eastern Europe. And I'm saying about that because in the general perception in contemporary constitution, uh, comparative constitutions, compa constitutional courts in these countries, very activist, very independent, often very brave constitutional courts, very often are subject to certain idealization. They are being pre presented and understood, and of course very much also their own self-perception. As the only protectors of constitutional <coughs> values and of the constitutional discourse in the world. <coughs> and while often it is indeed the case, and while often it is indeed the case that constitutional court decisions are on the side of protection of constitutional rights and liberties and freedoms and separation of power and state of law and the rule of law. And all these important values about which so beautifully the president, the, sorry, the deputy president of Turkish Bar Association said in the introductory speech to this symposium. Nevertheless, my own analysis and observation of Central and Eastern Europe, which is a fertile ground for this analysis, precisely because constitutional courts there are so powerful and so willing to undertake responsibility for constitutional discourse, is that it's very much a mixed bag. That it's not an unqualifiedly good thing from the point of view of spreading and promoting constitutional values in the society. Because there is also a dark side to it. And the dark side is the following. There is a risk, and it's a real risk, and it's a real cost. The constitutional court, by assuming and by jealously protecting their supremacy uh, on constitutional wisdom, will end up claiming monopoly on constitutional argument in this society. And therefore, that there will be some sort of unwholesome division of labor between main political actors. So that constitutional courts will be seen as being on the side of constitutional values while the political actors, and in particular legislatures and the executives, will be seen and therefore will be reduced to the role of defending interests of their constituents. There is also a risk of perverse incentives which means that the existence of strong constitutional courts having the last word on constitutional wisdom uh, will prompt and will promote certain degree of legislative irresponsibility because members of parliaments will know that their statutes which are constitutionally defective will be struck down by constitutional court anyway. And finally, there is a real danger of <clears throat> petrifying a certain view that constitutional rights are a matter for a technical expertise in which lawyers have particularly privileged position. And therefore, the <coughs> discussions on issues which in many again, I'm talking only for post-communist states of Central and Eastern Europe, are very controversial issues of the day. Certain fundamental moral issues are, yes, I'm finished, thank you, uh, will become the preserve of lawyers uh, to which, you know, like, uh, political arguments made by 